I've, I've directed 40 films and produced another 20 films. And, um, and then on top of that, you know, an author of books and, and I'm always writing for magazines, uh, you know, about my love of different films and whatnot, or doing extras for Blu-rays. Um, I just have a blast, you know, it's, it's, it's what I wanted to do and it's just in my blood. And, um, you know, I, I think I had the, the most creative fun back in the 90s when low budget films were still by being budgeted in like the $1.2 million range. That's, that's about, you know, as, as big as, as I got. But that was a decent amount of money to actually, you know, do some pretty cool things. And um, I was able to, you know, not only with Guilty as Charged, but uh, I did uh, did two films, Oblivion One and Two, with, that with were, were full, Newmar, moon, right? full moon productions for at the Paramount were financing, and it was with Julie Newmar, George Takei, Isaac Hayes again. Um, Maxwell Caulfield was in the second one. Um, I mean, Carl Stryken, the the guy who plays uh, Lurch in the Adams Family movies and the Giant on Twin Peaks, and Meg Foster, who has those incredible ice blue eyes, and uh, you know, again, just just dream cast. <laughs> Lands of space. There's a wild new frontier. You got a problem, Red Eye? Yeah! Yeah, I got a problem! Where the good guys are only human. You get out of town, or I'll kill you. You ain't gonna kill nobody. And the bad guys are not. <laughs> We're gonna show the good people of oblivion the great advantages to a town run by Red Eye. Ah! Where the liquors hide. Jim, beat me up. And the women are wild. Oh, delicious. And the natives are on the warpath. Great Scotty! Because in this town, it's not cowboys and Indians. Not so fast, Pocahontas. It's cowboys and aliens. together. Oh, oh, who's with me? Yeah! My family's spirits cry out to be avenged. I love the way this guy talks. Is that a fact? Definitely. Oblivion. It's high noon in outer space. We made those films in Romania and it was a West, basically a, a, a space Western. <laughs> and How was it to film in Romania? It was, it was fantastic because labor is so cheap, we could actually build things from scratch. And we literally, the Western, the whole movie kind of takes place in this Western town on, a, on another planet. But we built that whole Western town from the ground up. When I got there, it was a cornfield. And that, that town is still there in the back lot, what became the back lot, of Castell Films, and you can see it, and it pops up all the time. It was the last time I saw it was in the Hatfields and the McCoys miniseries with with Kevin Costner, and there they are walking around the set that I helped design and build. I mean, it's just the weirdest, weirdest thing to see it still being used. And uh, so, you know, that was really fun. And then, you know, another film that I was able to design. Oh, and by the way, before we leave of the Oblivion movies. I got Pino DiNaggio to score them, and he did it with a full orchestra oh. in Italy. And Pino DiNaggio, for those that don't know, who I met through De Palma back in my De Palma days, he did Carrie, he did Dress to Kill, he did Blowout, he did you know Body Double, all those great De Palma films. And he also did um, the way the way De Palma found him was he had done a film called Don't Look Now that Nicholas Rogue had directed with Julie Christie and Donald Sutherland and in the early 70s and was an amazing score. And I was a big fan of Pino from that before De Palma even started using him. And uh, so it was great to be able to, you know, to get Pino to do one of my movies, which was great fun. But what I was gonna move on to was 
Elvira's Haunted Hills. Well, I want, before, oh, back, I, oh yeah, go ahead. Before go we ahead. start there, I've got to pause for a second. Okay. I, I, I know we said an hour. How much time <laughs> do you have? How much time do you have another extra half hour? Oh, yeah, hour? yeah I, I, I've got time. Okay, because I am having so much fun. <laughs> <laughs> I just, you're wonderful. You really, I, I mean, it, anyway. Um, yes, and you know, about the Elvira, you were talking, you mentioned like five, six minutes ago, <laughs> you mentioned yeah. blood, and I immediately went to Elvira. Yes, yes. Well, so, it was interesting, the, um, the way the Elvira movie came about, and this yeah. is the story. Um, the, I was a huge fan of Elvira uh, from her hosting days in the 80s, um, where she was hosting horror films on TV. And then she did a film called, her first Elvira movie called Elvira and Mistress of the Dark. And it was about 1988 or so. And I loved that film. I thought it was the most hysterical movie. And so I, in about nine, right after my first feature, Guilty as Charge, um, a really dear friend of mine, Terry Sweeney, and his, his partner now, husband, Lanier Laney, were through a party in Hollywood that I went to. Now, Terry Sweeney was in the 80s. He was uh, a Saturday Night Live cast member who, he was the first openly gay cast member, and he's the one who famously always did Nancy Reagan in drag. And his partner, Lanier, had gone to school with me at the University of South Carolina. So I knew them very well and went to Saturday Night Live tapings and stuff like that to, to hang with them. And so when I moved to L.A. and they moved to L.A. to become writers for Mad TV, anyway, Terry was throwing this party and I go there and over in the corner in a chair is Cassandra Peterson. And I went over to Terry and I'm like, Terry! I didn't know you knew Cassandra, you've got to introduce me. And he said, oh, come, come with me. So we go over and I'm, you know, fawning like a super fan and telling her how much I love her and I'm not worthy in the whole business. And then Terry said, well, Sam is a director. He just did his first feature called Guilty as Charged. And Cassandra goes, oh, Guilty as Charged? I just saw that and I love that movie. In fact, I loved it so much that I, been wanting to meet you because if I ever do another Elvira movie, I want you to direct it. And I'm like, what? And, and it, I'm like, is this what happens at Hollywood parties? Uh, <laughs> you had, what's going on here? So we became friends. She came and did a, a cameo appearance in a film I did called Acting on Impulse, which was my second feature um, that starred Nancy Allen from My Diploma Days. Uh, Linda Fiorentino, C. Thomas Howell, Isaac Hayes, again, uh, Zelda Rubenstein, again, again, uh, just an amazing cast of people. Um, and Cassandra came, I wanted her to play, a, not Elvira, but a, a bouncer at a country western bar. And she said, great, I'll, I'll do a Dolly Parton thing. I'll, and so she borrowed a blonde wig from Daryl Hannah and and did this whole, you know, sort of improvise this little scene outside of this country western bar where she cards at the door Nancy Allen and C. Thomas Allen, Linda Ferentino as they're whisked in. And um, so we had so much fun and I continued to be social friends with Cassandra and they, she did a pilot for a TV series that, that I went to the taping of but it never got picked up. And then uh, but she kept trying to get a film off the ground. And it wasn't happening. So in the late a late 1990s, um, she gives me a call and she said, "Okay, everybody in town's turned us down to do another Elvira movie. So my husband and I have decided we're going to finance it ourselves. We're going to mortgage our house and we're going to do it ourselves. And I know that I promised you that you could direct it, but." You know, my husband feels like we need to interview a bunch of people and be professional and da da da. But you're on the list, and we do want you to come in and meet with us. So I go there, and she hands me the script, Elvira's on her Hills, and she said, "Now this is a spoof of the Vincent Price, Edgar Allan Poe, Roger Corman films of the '60s, like Pit in the Pendulum, House of Usher, Tomb of Ligeia, all of those." Um, and she goes, "Are you familiar with them?" And I'm like, "Cassandra." <laughs> Am I familiar with them? Here is Vincent Price's monologue from the climax of Pit and the Pendulum. Do you know where you are, Bartolome? You are about to enter hell. Hell, the Neverworld, the Infernal Region, the abode of the damned, 
a place of torment, Gehenna, Naraka, the pit, and the pendulum, the razor edge of destiny, thus the condition of man, bound on an island from which he can never or hope to escape, surrounded by the waiting pit of hell, which must destroy him finally. And she looks at me like I have lost my mind, and she goes, you're hired. <laughs> <laughs> and that's how I got it. I memorized that freaking monologue in junior high school. We were given a, a, an acting assignment to do a monologue and they wanted us to do Shakespeare or whatever. Shakespeare, bleh. I wanted to do something I liked. And I knew if I said, you know, can I do a monologue from a Vincent Price movie? That was not gonna go over at all. So I said, could I do Edgar Allan Poe? And the teacher said, you know, oh yes, that would be fine. And of course I had back in those days before VHS, before anything, I taped the audio of movies from a microphone onto a reel to reel tape recording machine right off of the TV speaker. I used and to I do it had... with a cassette machine. <laughs> yeah, well I predate cassettes. That's how old I am. So <laughs> I had Pit in the Pendulum on a reel-to-reel, -reel, and I went and transcribed that whole freaking thing. Now, I knew that that speech was written by Richard Matheson, the screenwriter, <laughs> not Edgar Allan Poe, but I was not about to tell the teacher that. And I went in, and I did my monologue, and I got an A. And it just stuck with me, you know, having to transcribe it and memorize it and everything else. And it stuck with me all those decades and came in very handy because it's exactly what got me that job. And I, and I obviously remember it to this very day. And, and maybe I'll get another job out of it. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> but so we now she had already gone to Romania of all places in the world, a place that I had already made two films at. And she had looked at the castles and thought, oh, we're gonna shoot on location in a castle. And I was like, I've been to those castles on our days off on Oblivion. And, you know, they were all in the middle of nowhere and up at the top of mountains. And some of them didn't have running water and some of them didn't have electricity and some of them weren't furnished. And it just like, you know, no, 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 no. This is not what you wanna do. And if you're spoofing, Roger Corman movies, none of them were shot in castles. They were all set bound in, on, on a sound stage. And the establishing shots were these great matte paintings or models or whatever. And, you know, we, if we're going to spoof it, we need to do it in that way. And the beauty of going to Romania is because of the cheap labor. We'll be able to build the most amazing sets. And so I convinced her that that's the direction we needed to go into. And I got the, um, the, our production designer had worked with me on Oblivion. And I started sending him all the films, all the Corman films and stuff. And he was looking at everything. And I said, look, we've got, you know, when, look at the pit and the pendulum. When we do our pit and the pendulum, what they did was they built the slab and they built the pendulum and the walls up to a certain height. But then for, for the wide shots, the rest of it was like a matte painting or whatever to extend out the rest of the set. And the production, the Romanian production designer, Radu Korcheva, said, oh, we've got some great old time matte painters that, you know, were just, did all the great classics back in the day. And, um, you know, we'll get them to do this. We'll do it the old fashioned way and they'll love it. So I'm saying, perfect. So I get over there and Radu meets me at the airport and he goes, okay, so I've got good news and bad news. The, the bad news is that all those map painters that I was hoping to get have all died. <laughs> and so we're not going to be able to do that. But just come with me. And we get to the studio and he takes me in. And we walk into the set that he has built for the pit and the pendulum. And it is, I feel like I walked onto at Pinewood Studios, one of the James Bond layer sets, or, you know, the volcano set in, uh, where they're inside the volcano in- You Only Live you Twice. You Only Live Twice or something. It was this massive set, and the ceiling goes up forever, and the pit goes way down here. He has built the entire thing from ceiling to, to bottomless pit, all practical and these incredible Hieronymus Bosch murals on the walls and just everything was unbelievable. And, and it just, he took me from one set to another and we go to the interior of the castle with this beautiful, you know, um, you know stairway and I didn't want the banister. I wanted, you know, those, those terrifying stairways that they always had in, in these castles. 
in, in the Dracula and in different movies, you know, and with this incredible staircase and just all these interiors, I, 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 I cried. It was just like a dream come true. And it was, everything was made to order. You know, it was exactly what I wanted from, for that movie. And we had so much fun making it. Not only was Cassandra in it, but we had Richard O'Brien of Rocky Horror Picture Show fame playing yes. the Vincent Price character. And for people who don't know, I mean, he was he was riff raff in Rocky Horror Picture Show, yeah. but he wrote Rocky Horror. He wrote the original play, the libretto, the lyrics, the music. And when the movie was made, he he did the screenplay. He is Mr. Rocky Horror, yeah. and he knew all of Vincent Price's films and knew exactly what we were spoofing. And it was it was just incredible. You won't be able to move. You won't be able to scream. You won't be able to take your eyes off of Elvira's Haunted Hills. Allow me to present. Elvira. Yeah, nice meeting you too. Elvira. Entertainer extraordinaire. See Elvira stretch herself as an actress in her most challenging role. I just love butterflies ever so much. Richard O'Brien in his most horrifying performance since the Rocky Horror Picture Show. Oh, why? 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 Snap out of it. Yeah, what are you going for, an Oscar? A film that is so steamy. Oh, Lord have mercy. <laughs> so shocking. That's another unfortunate Elzebus family trait. Catalepsy. Fear of cats? You'll scream. Yes, Johan! You'll gasp. <gasps> You'll die laughing. Mom! Damn, hate when that happens. From the masterfully macabre mind of Elvira. Right, like there's something going on in my mind. Elvira's Haunted Hills. The village people say this castle is evil. Yeah, who listens to the village people anymore? <laughs> Was that the movie that Terry Ray met you on? No, Terry... Uh, um... Well, no. Terry was an extra in the first Elvira movie. Okay. And so, um, so we didn't actually meet through the Elvira connection. But um, I'm trying to think when I first met Terry. I guess it was when, when at Here TV, the gay network, they were starting. Uh, Terry had brought them this project called From Here On Out. And uh, they immediately, because I... I had done Dante's Cove for Pure TV, and they immediately thought of me as, a, as the perfect director for that. And so I think that's how that all came about. And then once we started putting together our, you know, mutual friends and people that we knew and everything, it was, it was like, oh my God, we have the, all these Elvira connections. And, um, and so I ended up directing that series for him. And then we did another series called um, uh, My Sister is So Gay. <laughs> And I did the first season of that with Terry. And anyway, it's, it, 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 Terry's so funny and so oh, great. I love him. Love working with him. Just as And um, so, yeah, I mean, the Elvira thing was just, that was uh, probably the most, the most fun I've ever had, the most laughs I've ever had doing a, a film. And it was just, and it was a dream, such a dream come true, being able to spoof those great Vincent Price films that I love so much. And I knew, you know, we kind of skipped over it, but I knew Vincent Price, as did Cassandra. I knew, I was a super fan, and when I was a teenager, I would go see, when he would be on tour with lecture tours and stuff, I'd go and see him and meet him backstage. And he, you know, he and I got to know each other. And um, when I went to England when I was 17, to interview all the Hammer film people for a fanzine that I did. This was, it was called Bazaar. And this was, this, this was the issue number three that I put out in 1974 when I was about 17. Um, I went over there and, you know, looking to interview, you know, Christopher Lee and Peter Cushing and, and all the Hammer film people. But I also wanted to interview Diana Rigg from yes. the Avengers TV series, who just passed away this year yeah. in, you know, in Game of Thrones. But, she, you know, to me, growing up, she was Emma Peel on the Avengers, and a goddess. 
and, and James also, Bond's wife, and exactly James Bond's wife in in Honor Majesty's Secret Service. Yeah, and Vincent Price's daughter in Theater of Blood. <laughs> So I very much wanted to interview her about all of this, and particularly Theater of Blood, which was fairly new at that time. And I wasn't, I, I had been successful getting other interviews, but I was having a hard time getting her people to pay attention to me. And so she was on the West End starring in Pygmalion on stage and I'm playing a Eliza Doolittle. And I'm like, well, I've got to see that anyway, and I'll go there, and maybe afterwards at the stage door, I'll get to meet her, and we, you know, I can beg for an interview. So I go there, and of course it's sold out. I'm just there, you know, temporarily on vacation. But there's always somebody selling a ticket out front. I managed to buy a ticket. It was like right in the orchestra, you know, fantastic seat. I take my seat, waiting for the play to begin and I hear this laugh that is very familiar right behind me. I turn around and it's Vincent Price <laughs> and new and his new wife Coral Brown who who they had just met while shooting Theater of Blood and Diana Rigg was actually the person who introduced them. Oh. And there they are sitting and before my mouth drops open and before I can even utter uh, anything Vincent says, Sam, what are you doing here? <laughs> and I couldn't believe that he remembered my name. You know, it was still, even though we sort of knew each other, it was still like, you know, a fan. And I just was blown away. And I told him what I was doing and that I wanted to get uh, Diana to be interviewed for my magazine. And he said, well, you're coming back stage with us, dear boy. And so after the show, <laughs> We go back and we drink champagne with Diana Rigg and he puts her on the spot and she can't say no to an interview. And she tells me to come back on the day when she's doing a matinee and an evening performance and she kind of hangs out in between shows and we did it there, you know, in her dressing room. And it was fantastic and she was unbelievably nice and it was great. And, um, and then while we're just for two seconds, ah, there's so many things to talk about. While on that same trip, I had already interviewed Christopher Lee by mail, um, sending him a questionnaire, and I printed one an interview like that in one of my earlier issues. But I wanted to meet him in person, and so as soon as I knew that my parents, I bamboozled my parents into sending me to London as a graduate high school graduation present. As soon as I knew I was going, I wrote to him and everybody else that I could get the address for and said, I'm coming. And he wrote back and said, well, when you get here, I'll take you to lunch. So I call him up and he said, well, I'm, I'm working. You're gonna have to come to meet me for lunch at Pinewood Studios. And I said, no problem. And I get on the train, go out to Pinewood. He didn't really mention what he was doing. <laughs> I get out there. He's making a little film called Man with the Golden Gun, <laughs> the James Bond movie, in which he is playing the man with the golden gun. He's the villain in it. Right, right. So he's, so he's been re released for lunch early. We have lunch, I interview him with my little tape recorder. And then he said, so, you know, they're, um, they're not gonna need us back for another hour. They're just breaking the rest of the cast and crew for lunch. And they were starting to stream into the commissary. And he said, why don't you come with me and I'll give you a tour of the James Bond sets. Oh. So an hour. He gives me this private tour and we're walking around just the two of us where he's explaining all of the sets and it, it, we're going through his character was Scaramanga and we yeah. go through Blair and in this little hallway there's this these the walls were all these glass cabinets and behind the glass were a collection of butterflies that were tacked up on on the walls and I said to him I said you know are these butterflies real and he goes Sam this is a James Bond film, not a Hammer film. And oh. Hammer, for those who don't know, was the low budget horror company that made all of his Dracula movies. And, and he, you know, Christopher Lee, God love him, and I absolutely adore him and would never say anything negative, but he did, he was, you know, he kind of felt like those movies were a little beneath him. And he really wanted to be doing like James Bond movies and he wanted to work with all the big boys and to his credit, he did. He was in the Lord of the Rings movies and he was in Tim Burton movies and 
and Steven Spielberg's 1941 and Hugo directed by Martin Scorsese. And, you know, he, he did some amazingly great, huge, huge movies. But the irony, of course, is that every single director that I just mentioned only cast him because they fell in love with him as Dracula in those little low budget Hammer films. <laughs> and wow. so anyway, but um, I then he said, just spend the rest of the day. And I watched them, you know, they came back from lunch and I watched Roger Moore and Britt Eklund and Maude Adams and Christopher Lee and his little sidekick in the movie, Herve Villachez. Oh yes. <laughs> from Fantasy Island, De Plain, De Plain. And but that was wasn't that wasn't that before Fantasy Island or it might uh, it's like right I, it might have been it might have been um, but at any rate we at the end of the day it was I mean I didn't get to see any car crashes or chase scenes or explosions or snogging unfortunately but you know they they were shooting a, a scene around the dinner table you know relatively sedate scene and um, but at the end of the day. Christopher Lee said, you know, do you want to ride back to London in the studio's, you know, Rolls Royce limo? And I'm like, yeah. So I get in the back in the little fold down trundle seat and I'm facing the back seat. And on the back seat is Christopher Lee, who's about 6'6", six, six, and Herve Velasquez, who is a little person and was, you know, the two size difference was, was hilarious in and of itself. And Herve was already 10 sheets to the wind and started telling us on the ride back, started telling us all the stories about, okay, kids out of the room for a second, telling all the stories about the prostitutes that he had hired since he had been in London, and then going into graphic detail of everything he was doing to them. And Christopher Lee, who normally is a very, you know, relatively serious gentleman, started to laugh, and then he started to howl, and then he just was completely doubled over in hysterics, and got me, and you know, and I was laughing too, and every time he would try to compose himself, I would laugh, and he'd get him laughing again, and, and all Herve had to do was to say one more nasty word or whatever, and we'd be, you know, guffawing again, and it was just the most hilarious car ride I've ever had. And when we finally dropped Christopher Lee off at his house in Cadogan Square, I just remember pulling away and looking out the back window and he literally, his hand was on the gate and he was just still laughing, doubled over, trying to compose himself before he went in to face his wife and, and he did not want to have to tell her what was making him laugh so hard. <laughs> but. Um, you know, it was just incredible stuff like that to be able to meet these people and interview them and, you know, and then put out my magazine. And, and uh, so that's why when I finally did The Fury, I knew the importance of getting, you know, having one-on-one uh, -on -one interviews because, and so that's why I got that assignment from Cine Fantastique because then I would, I would be able to have one-on-ones with, with all the stars of that movie. And and it was, you know, it was something that I'd been doing a lot of. So I was very, you know, had a lot of training and experience with it. Um, so, you know, the, anyway, long, hugely long side story. But so I did know Vincent Price and the fact that we were able, that, and Cassandra had gotten to know him as well. Yeah. And the fact that we were able to lovingly spoof all those Vincent Price Poe films in Elvira's Haunted Hills. We thought of it like we were, like Mel Brooks was doing a loving spoof of, of all the universal Frankenstein movies with young Frankenstein. And that's what we felt we were doing with our movie with the Vincent Price films. And we dedicated the film to Vincent. And if he had been alive, we would have, you know, we would have insisted that he play the character. And, uh, but he had died a few years earlier than that. We actually, off, before Richard O'Brien, um, who did play the Vincent Price character in it, we, had, we tried to get Christopher Lee. His people said that, no, he doesn't do those kinds of roles anymore. So we were very disappointed about that. And then we even approached Mick Jagger, who turned it down. <laughs> and, uh, and there were a couple, and Richard Chamberlain, because Cassandra Peterson is a very close friend of Richard Chamberlain, you know, Dr. Kildare, but you know, he had done all kinds of great films. And um, 
And but he uh, he had other uh, mini series or something that it, that he was doing and couldn't do it. But it you know it, it went went around that it ended up with the person who really should have done it, and that was Richard O'Brien. I mean, he was he was absolutely he was a blessing in disguise. He was the perfect perfect person to be in that role. Wow, I just you 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 like. I feel like you're taking me down a hallway, and then oh, we're gonna go this way. Yeah, and, and then that and I keep remembering things that happen, and, you know, so I, yeah, anyway. All, it, the, all the stuff that I grew up loving, <laughs> like the man, I mean, again, I, I collected all the James Bond albums. Yeah. Too. Oh and, my God, and you know, Sean Connery just passed away oh. this past week on Halloween. That was such, you know, that was very sad, but you know, he lived a, a full life, he was 90. Yeah. Um, but my God, he will always be my James Bond. That's the James Bond that I grew up with, and I've, uh, and you know, it was, it was just amazing. But I'm still a huge, huge Bond fan to this day, and can't wait to see No Time to Die <laughs> if it I ever can get released. <laughs> what a what a title for a film for the year that he goes. Oh no! And, what um, is it? I mean, just jumping for a second, uh, uh, is uh, Sean Connery died this year? Honor Blackman and yes. uh, the 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 actress who played Gold, the one who was Gold. Yeah, um, Shirley Eaton. Shirley Eaton. And, but, oh, no, 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 no. There was, there were two, oh, not gosh. Shirley Eaton. She died a, a while back. But there was a model oh. who was, who's also painted gold and is appears on the, on the album cover and in different things. But uh -huh. in the movie itself, it was Shirley, it was supposed to be Shirley Eaton. But I think this other girl was like a stand in or I'm not quite sure how that all worked, but she did a lot of the publicity photos and everything. And that's the one who died recently. I forget her name, right. but um, and then of course Diane Rigg died just. Oh recently. yes! Oh. So you know, of all the Bond girls, I think Diana Rigg is, is probably one of my very, very, very top favorites yeah. from Honor Majesty's Secret Service, and um, and then okay, I'll just I'll go there. One of my other favorite Bond girls is Jane Seymour. Oh, from I love her. And oh. I got. Interview. I got to go to lunch with Jane Seymour when I was 17 and interviewed her for this mag, this magazine, because she had been, she played the female creature in Frankenstein: The True Story, which is what's on the cover, and she played the female creature Prima in that miniseries. It was a two-part miniseries in 1973 on NBC, made by Universal, with this amazing all-star cast: um, James Mason. Leonard Whiting is Dr. Frankenstein. He had been Romeo and Zeffirelli's Romeo and Juliet. Um, yeah. David McCallum, Agnes Moorhead, Sir oh. Ralph Richardson, Sir John Heelgood. Um, just the most amazing cast. And Jane Seymour, who was, had literally just finished shooting Live and Let Die. Solitaire. Yep, Solitaire. Very good. Um, she had just <laughs> Shooting, and like literally three days later started filming this movie at the same studio at Pinewood Studios. And when I saw this film on TV, it played over two nights. I absolutely, I mean, it was already a huge Frankenstein movie fan anyway, but I fell in love with this movie and Michael Sarazen played the creature. And what was unique about this production was that the creature started out beautiful and then slowly started to deteriorate. And that was a whole new way of going about it. Now, um, I was 17 when I saw it, still a uh, closeted gay teen, trying to figure out my life. And this movie spoke to me. I, it, the, there was, I could tell there was some sort of gay subtext going on in this movie because the creature was so beautiful Dr. Frankenstein was, you know, this 23-year-old gorgeous actor who played Romeo, Leonard Whiting. And I just felt like their relationship felt very much like the relationship in Pygmalion, you know, between um, Eliza Doolittle and Henry Higgins, where the doctor was teaching the creature how to be a gentleman and to present him into society. And they go on a date to the opera and you know, it's like all this stuff, and I'm just like, whoa, is this, was this all intentional? I couldn't tell, but it certainly spoke to me, and it certainly felt like it was intentional. Well, then I 
started interviewing people from it and um, I find out the screenwriters uh, were Christopher Isherwood and Don Bacardi, one of the most famous gay couples ever. Christopher Isherwood wrote the book that Cabaret was based on and wrote A Single Man. And, and Don Bacardi is a very famous um, portrait artist. And I find out that the producer of the film is gay, Hans Stromberg Jr., who discovered Vampira, the horror, and wrote and produced her hosting gig in the 50s, the very first host, horror host thing. So yeah. there's a weird connection there. But Hans Stromberg Jr.'s dad was a huge um, producer at MGM, produced the Thin Man movie, some of my favorite movies of all time, produced The Women, produced um, Karloff's uh, Mask of Fu Manchu, and produced another film with Karloff and Lucille Ball called Lourdes. And so this producer had grown up in Hollywood, but had grown up with Boris Karloff as one of his family friends. Um, he knew Elsa Lanchester, who was making a movie for his dad at the very same time she was doing The Bride of Frankenstein, and he had met her. He had all these horror roots and loved horror films. And his favorite movie of all time is Bride of Frankenstein, like mine. Yeah. And his and he became head of um, of CBS programming in the late '50s and early '60s, where he helped champion and and develop series like The Munsters, um, Gilligan's Island, The Wild Wild West, uh, the Twilight Zone, the Alfred Hitchcock Presents, and the list goes on and on and on. All these iconic shows that I grew up on. And then he became an independent producer. And what did he want to do? His dream project of all time was to make Frankenstein the true story. And this was his dream project, baby. And he wanted it to be, I didn't tell everybody this, but he wanted it to be very, very, very loaded with gay subtext. And so he had this great gay couple writing it. And, um, and he had several other gay comrades in different positions. The editor was John Schlesinger's editor. He was gay. Um, and they called themselves the Lavender Hill Mob because they were trying their best to sneak in as much gay subtext into this network, you know, primetime miniseries. Yeah. So years later, um, in, in 2017, I um, was able to write an entire magazine on this film and to interview Jane Seymour again uh, and everyone else involved in who was still around and still alive. And the editor of this mag is the magazine is called Little Shop of Horrors and it's edited and published by Richard Clemenson. And he knew how much I loved this movie and how much I knew about it and how much I wanted to write about the gay subtext and sort of reclaim or claim for the first time ever you know, this film is as having so, so much of a queer influence and a queer subtext. And so I had the entire issue. We did a three panel mural full up. Um, had this incredible painting by Mark Maddox. I got Anne Rice to write the foreword because this was the film that inspired her to write Interview with the Vampire, which launched her entire career as a writer. Yeah. And she absolutely loves this movie. And I won the Rondo Award very proudly for best article of the year. And it's, it's like a miniature book. And it's just all about the making of, of the film. And there are 120 pages and 400 photographs in this book. Is that obsessive enough for you? Oh my God. <laughs> well, and, you know, this and this, before I leave it, um, yeah, yeah. it led to um, Shout Factory or Screen Factory getting me to do all of the extras for this brand new release this year, 2020, Frankenstein, The True Story on Blu-ray. And they did a, a absolutely beautiful, um, you know, mass remastering 2K. And it looks better than it, it even looked when it first showed on NBC because nobody had this kind of, you know, resolution on their TV sets in 1973. And it is incredible. It's three hours. Without, you know, it was over two nights and a four hour slot, but there was an hour worth of commercials. When you take all the commercials away, it's three hours. And I do a three hour audio commentary on here. And I interviewed on camera Jane Seymour again <laughs> for the third time. Um, and I went to London to interview Leonard Whiting, who played Dr. Frankenstein. 
And then I got Don Picardi, the co-screenwriter, to, to also be interviewed for it. And so you've got to check out this movie, people. It's so, so, so good. And kind of a lost gem. And uh, not, not that many people know about it because it kind of showed on TV back then. And it was so long, it wasn't easy to program on you know late night slots and stuff like that. So it just hasn't been seen by uh, very many people since, since it first aired back in 1973. So definitely check this out and it's well, you know it's i know what i'm 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 asking santa for christmas <laughs> <laughs> or excuse me for hanukkah uh, yeah so um, with jay seymour having interviewed her at age 17 and then again in 2017 for this magazine and then again for this where we went to her house and actually videotaped it um you know she's i have to say she's my favorite bond Bond girl. <laughs> She's so amazing. And you could tell that she just has a real, true, beautiful soul. Oh, she does. She um, really does. And, and she's been so supportive of, of my trying to, you know, reintroduce Frankenstein, the true story to, to fans and, um, and to give it a new lease on life and, and, and to look at it in a different way than people have looked at it or, or considered it necessarily before. Well, so she's been very, very helpful. Talking about you as a writer, I actually, before this morning when I was looking through, I actually ordered your new book today on Amazon. Uh, it's toilet Paper Caper. Yes. <laughs> I'm glad you brought that up because, uh, you know, I, I just happen to have a copy right here. <laughs> OK. So when we had this uh, shutdown and I couldn't direct movies, I was getting very itchy to be creative. And I was also having a very hard time finding toilet paper. I think all of us were for a while back in March and April. Yes. And, and I literally went to a grocery store and was like talking to the guy at the front and going, you know, what, what do you have to do to get toilet paper around here? And, and I, I suddenly felt like I was doing a drug deal. <laughs> oh my God. And I thought, all right, there's some humor to be had with this. And so I decided to write a parody of a children's book in the style of those little golden books we all had as kids. And it's called Sam's Toilet Paper Caper. And it's all about me trying to procure toilet paper <laughs> during the pandemic. And, uh, and it's, it's beautifully illustrated by this friend of mine, Dan Gallagher. And there's all sorts of movie references. If you can see right here, the, um, the grocery store clerk looks suspiciously like Peter Lorre. Yes. And, oh, uh, you know, I've got, I have to have a De Palma thing in here. So right. when I'm, I, I'm feeling very embarrassed at one point and I just feel like oh, they're all gonna laugh at you. So I have ah! a bucket of blood being poured all over me and Piper Lorre up here, la you know, laughing. They're all gonna laugh at you. And, um, so there's just, it's loaded with film references from the sound of music to the good, the bad, and the ugly and everything, and you'll love it. Now, the really good news about this, it's only 10 bucks and all the profits, not a portion of the profits, all the profits go to the World Health Organization's COVID-19 Solidarity Response Fund. And so it's a great Christmas gift. You can buy dozens of these. And uh, they're, I, I highly recommend the paperback because I feel like every bathroom needs one of these. It's perfect porcelain <laughs> thrown reading material, people. And I'm not mine. <laughs> so anyway, Sam's Toilet Paper Caper on Amazon. You can also, aside from the paperback, you can also get it as an ebook if you prefer. Yeah. Um, and I will mention that today, we're taking this interview on um, November 5th. I have a new I have a new book that just got released today on Amazon paperback. I don't even have a hard copy yet. I haven't even seen it. Um, it's paper is available in paperback and ebook, and this one is a little more adult. <laughs> I'd say a lot more adult, but also all the proceeds, everything is going to the World Health Organization's COVID nineteen Solidarity and Response Fund. So it's for a good cause. Now. Take the children out of the room. The name of the book is Orbgasm. <laughs> and it is about a, it's a science fiction 
thriller that's very sexy and very erotic and but also has tons of film references and is just kind of kooky and wacky i say that it is a an erotic pulp sci-fi satiricon and uh and i think you'll you know film fans will will definitely get a, a big kick out of it and it's about a, a woman who is a james bond bond girl starlet who uh, an orb falls from outer space into her backyard. And the orb is not only miraculously cure all diseases, it also makes people very horny. <laughs> and she teams up with her uh, best gay friend, this very hunky guy who's an author, who is a mashup author, and his latest book is Frankenstein Meets the Three Musketeers. And um, and they team up on the and take this orb on the road and are trying to take it to her dad who has Alzheimer's because they want to cure him, and the government is after them. They want to, you know, the dark state want to want to to confiscate this orb, and so they're on the land trying to hide from the authorities, and uh, and it becomes a road picture kind of like Thelma and Louise, or in this case Thelma and Lewis, and. Um, so anyway, it's a fun it's a fun book, but it's very sexy. It's called Orbgasm, O R B G A S M, and it just became available today on Amazon and paperback and ebook. And I could see uh, after we're out of uh, <laughs> quarantine, it's going to you're going to make it into a film. <laughs> well. It actually, truth be known, it started out as a screenplay many years ago. Yeah. And um, I, it was in 1995, if you can believe it, 25 years ago, the, this, this idea was spawned. And it was going to be made by Showtime. I had made one other science fiction um, sort of with comic elements called Out There. Yeah. And, uh, and we were going to do this sort of a follow up. And, uh, but then the regime changed to Showtime and you know what happens then, all the projects and development get thrown out. And so I went into a drawer. Um, back then, one of the diseases that was very important for this orb to cure was AIDS. Mm -hmm. And shortly after that, the drugs for AIDS got better and um, it was no longer the boogeyman quite as much as it became a more manageable disease. And so, it just kind of knocked the wind out of the story for me a bit, and I just kind of kept it in a drawer. Well, now, with COVID-19, everybody's got cures on the brain again, and now it's suddenly relevant again. And so yeah. I updated it and made the diseases that, uh, that this orb was curing with the, you know, things that are threats nowadays. And uh, so I, it does feel like it's relevant again. So... Anyway, that's what got me all excited about, you know, wanting to use my time of not working <laughs> to turn this into a novel. And, and again, for cause for the COVID-19 fund with the World Health Organization. Right. Um, I, I thank you for, for staying longer with us. And, and this has just <laughs> been a joy. I, I mean, oh, I love it. I, I, I have to say, you know, I've been, of course, looking at that gorgeous room behind you and all your creations back there. <laughs> what? I, yeah, it's just, it's, it's, it's very minimalist. You know, <laughs> <laughs> no, we call it, it's kind of our, you know, curio shop on acid. <laughs> that's, that's how we describe our decorating uh, in, our, in our place. <laughs> my uh, husband, his name is Gary Bowers. He's a hairdresser, and we've been together for 38 years, collecting odds and ends of just anything that is bizarre and crazy, and that's what we have all over our place. And you'll find out when you read Sam's Toilet Paper Caper that I have a bathroom that is a Tarzan bathroom <laughs> from floor to ceiling, decorated in Tarzan memorabilia, from posters to figures to you name it. And it is featured in here. Uh, <laughs> here, here I am sitting on the toilet in ah. my and bathroom. <laughs> oh my god! There you go. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> so, anyway, yeah, we have we have fun with it. <laughs>